Hi everyone, my name is Uno Mota and I will be presenting our work on fair partitioning of public resources, redrawing district boundary to minimize spatial inequality in school funding, jointly done with Negar Mohammadi from the Tehran Institute for Advanced Studies, Palash Day from the Indian Institute of Technology in Karapur, Krishna Gumadi from the Max Planck Institute for Software Systems, and Abhignan Chakraborty from the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi. In this work, we propose a new kind of inequality index, namely the spatial inequality index, that takes a notion of similarity between individuals and measures how unequally they're being treated when compared to their neighbors. More specifically, we use this index to measure and subsequently minimize funding inequities amongst schooling districts in the US. For those of you unfamiliar with public schooling in the US, it is a widely accessible and free of charge schooling system and to function, it mainly relies on three sources of funding. Federal and state funding represent nationwide and state-specific contributions, and the remainder of funding stems from local property taxes. To clarify the latter, the same way that the whole country can be subdivided into states, each state can then be broken down into multiple schooling districts that essentially have legal boundaries separating them. Any property then that pertains to a certain district will then contribute to its public schools by paying taxes. In prior works, it was noted that state and federal sources seem to allocate more funds towards higher poverty schools. However, if we look at the funding coming from local property taxes, we observe the exact opposite trend. Not only that, but the difference in funding is so steep that the latter outweighs all other sources of funding and leads to poor schools getting less funding than wealthier schools. The difference being as large as $8,000 per student. Since redefining districts could potentially control for local property taxes, we need to understand how funding is currently distributed along district boundaries. By looking at every district across the US, we observe a high variance in their funding distributions. In some states, funding more than doubles between lesser funding districts and the highly funded ones. The second question is then, are differently funded districts far from one another, geographically speaking? And there seems to be no relation between distance and difference in funding. Take the example of the Greenport Union Free School District in New York that receives around $19,000 per student on a yearly basis. This district neighbors three other districts, the Sullivan West Central School District, the, De the Deposit Central School District, and the Downsville Central School District. These receive over $59,000, and $30,000 per student, respectively, so there are clear differences among immediate neighbors. We can almost intuitively describe at least some scenarios we would like to avoid. Closely geolocated districts getting a highly different funding is one of them. We understand that there are location-based factors that can influence funding, though it feels odd that a school potentially meters away from being in another district receives substantially lower or higher amounts of funding. We will use this notion when defining our spatial inequality index. By moving schools from one district to another, we may be able to create more equitable distributions of funding, but currently there are no measures to compare treatment among neighbors. So we propose this new spatial inequality index and generalize it to be applicable to various notions of similarity or neighborhoods. For instance, in recommender or ad delivery systems where similar users should be served similar content, our index could be used as a benchmarking or even a training metric. Besides our proposal, other inequality indices exist with the goal to measure unequal treatment for individuals in a population. Take a population of six individuals, each of which with a respective wage, and the example of the Gini index. This would take, this would iterate over all individuals in population and calculate the absolute wage difference to every other individual. And then I have a normalization factor that generally accounts for the number of individuals and overall wages. So intuitively, there will be an inequality va value greater than zero as long as some individuals have different wages. So if we were to equalize wages, then inequality would immediately be zero. Spatial inequality is different from such indices because there might be scenarios where we don't necessarily want to compare all individuals to measure unequal treatment. Imagine that all individuals are now employees at two distinct companies, company A and company B. There are essentially 
two distinct groups we can compare directly and there might exist specific individuals we deem as similar as well who would allow for an eventual comparison between these two companies. Prior research has shown that people tend to evaluate inequality based on their social position and that they rely on cues from their local environments to guess overall distributions of income. So there is a natural tendency for people to evaluate their own treatment based on their neighborhoods rather than every other individual. To accommodate for this, we formulate the spatial inequality index to still iterate over all individuals in the population, but only comparing their outcome with their neighbors. Lastly, we normalize it to the overall wealth in the population. So still here, there will be some inequality as immediate neighbors showcase differing wages, but it is only perceptible within each neighborhood. Groups of comparable individuals that yield very unequal treatment will yield a high contribution towards spatial inequality. If we were to equalize wages, much like in Gini, then inequality would still be zero. How can we now apply this concept to school redistricting? Well, schools' geographical proximity can define similarity from which assigned districts as neighborhoods can be considered. Instead of a wage, every school within a district has a corresponding amount of funding per student. So applying this to the existing district assignment will be our benchmark. Initially, states like Colorado, Nevada, and New Mexico seem to display high values of inequality, whereas states like Alabama or Vermont seem to display low values of inequality. Now that we're able to measure inequality in this way, we want to be able to minimize for it. So if we think about this problem as a graph partitioning problem, where our nodes are the schools and the edges represent their neighborhoods, then we just need to find the optimal partition scheme that would minimize our inequality, right? But it turns out that this problem is an NP-complete problem. We then developed a greedy heuristic algorithm that, starting from the current district assignment, iteratively picks the neighborhood with the highest contribution towards inequality and then greedily redistricts schools to mitigate funding imbalances among neighbors. This process repeats until the algorithm is done. We've also made it fully available in open source on GitHub, should you care to take a closer look. So now, how effective was the algorithm in practice? We were able to consistently reduce spatial inequality across all states, so we would say it was indeed effective. As an example, if we look at Colorado, initially one of the states with the highest spatial inequality, we see a much more homogeneous funding throughout the state after the algorithm was applied. As expected, funding distributions across districts within the state became a lot tighter, but we didn't con constrain our algorithm in any significant way. It could redistrict any amount of schools as long as it preserved the initial number of contiguous districts. So how different do our districts look in this approach? On the one hand, district sizes seem to remain mostly unchanged, but looking at the amount of schools redistricted tells a more interesting story. When running our algorithm, we kept track of not only the amount of schools redistricted, but also the reduction achieved in inequality for those numbers. States like Kansas would require 50% of its schools to be redistricted before it saw even 25% of the overall inequality reduction from our algorithm. On the other hand, states like West Virginia would only require less than 25% of schools being redistricted to observe the full effect. Interestingly, states like Nevada would require almost 80% of all schools to be redistricted to observe the full inequality reduction, but only 10% to already observe 75% of the whole effect. This is important because in the real world, it might not be possible to redistrict more than a certain fraction of all schools. So we can get a feeling for how our algorithm would perform for each state in that case. Finally, we tested what would happen if we also allowed our algorithm to merge districts, limiting only the maximum number of schools allowed per district. Of course, we recognize it may become an administrative short if districts are merged, but it is still important to note that the spatial inequality index could potentially be reduced even further. For a more detailed discussion on this topic, kindly read our paper. Thank you very much for listening.